ING really kind of shrugging its shoulders when it comes to the impact of a global min minimum 15% tax on corporates uh, when it comes to Asia, right? I want to throw up this chart taking a look at some of the corporate tax rates by country on the Bloomberg terminal. You can see there in the purple the likes of Japan at over 30%. And in fact, across Asia, the average is well over 20%. Do you see much of a meaningful impact here on either substantively or on sentiment? Yeah, I think there's two things to, to think about here. One is, do we have any economies uh, which are full of um, headquartered companies trying to evade global taxes? And the answer is no, because if they're in Japan, mm. if they're in, you know, wherever it is, they'll, you know, the, they would be paying the higher tax rate. So that, that doesn't work for them. So they're not going to be piling out. We're not going to see an exodus of these companies because they're not uh, they're not using Asia as a, as a sort of a safety hole anyway. But the other is, think about what's happened over the last um, 18 months or so, what's happened to government finances. They're all wrecked. You know, everyone's spent so much money trying to get dig themselves out of the COVID hole um, that what, what everyone's looking around for now is, is a source of revenue. And this provides one. So yes, if uh, if uh, you know Google or Amazon or whichever company it is operating in in these uh, these economies will now be paying some tax revenue to those authorities, where perhaps they were paying very little or, or even nothing. That's got to be good news for the receiving countries, without ho hopefully having too much of an impact on the prices that consumers pay for the goods and services received through uh, through those channels. So if Asia doesn't need to worry about tax, let's look, take a look at the other sort of perennial worry for the markets, right? Reflation or transitory inflation. Wherever you sit on the argument, you know, I, I keep going back to Janet Yellen's comments, really saying, is inflation that much of a bad thing, even if it's not transitory? Because we've spent how many decades now, you know, across most of the world trying to get out of deflation? Yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm with Yellen on this one. I mean, so long as it's it's either transitory or it's not very much. I mean, the difference between, uh, let's say, two and a half percent inflation and one and a half one and a half percent inflation is you know is marginal at, at the very best. What concerns me, and I think this should concern everybody, is whether transitory becomes non-transitory. In other words, you start to get you know the, the the wages maybe go up and then that pushes prices up and then because prices have gone up, wages go up and then you start to get the spiral. That's a problem. At the moment, even if this is protracted and we've got a lot of features a lot of factors pushing into this whether it's commodities whether it's semiconductors whether it is indeed bottlenecks in the labor supply perhaps due to some of the uh the measures that are put in place unemployment benefits and other sorts of things working from home these things could all come to an end but they could take a while to come to an end so we might be looking at a higher price level and at least in year on year terms higher inflation for some time but if that is all it is, and then eventually it settles down, who, you know, frankly, this shouldn't worry us at all. Um, but if it does get embedded, it's a problem. So at what point and what will you be looking at in order to gauge if this uh, inflationary pressure will really have that snowballing effect? I think one of the critical factors is whether you do start to see actual wage rates going up. And they're very hard to measure at the moment because they're measured in such a sort of quirky way. You sort of take the total amount of, of, of earnings and divide it by the number of people. What we want to see is, is some evidence of actual year-on-year -year wage growth is really beginning to pick up uh, and, and get stuck in. And that beginning to then have an impact on people's inflation expectations. That's the point where this stops being transitory one-off step change adjustment and starts to become a self-reinforcing pattern. Mm. So let's talk a little bit about all of the data that we're got, getting out of Asia this week, including those PPA, PPI numbers out of China. Yeah. We had trade numbers. We had Japan's uh, GDP numbers. So what catches your eye at this point? Uh, the Japan numbers are, are sort of largely historic. Uh, it's good news in the sense that the first quarter wasn't quite as bad, but the second quarter is the quarter that's more heavily affected by uh, states of emergency in the prefecture. So that's going to be a fairly horrible number, and we won't be looking at great full-year figures for Japan. The PPI figures, because they touch on that reflation slash inflation story, I think are, are more interesting. Uh, you know, consensus looking for something like eight and a half percent year on year. There's some base effects in there for sure. Uh, and of course, China, to some extent, is, is, is driving its own inflation higher with the, uh, you know, the, the hoarding of commodities that's apparently been taking place, which, of course, is feeding through into these PPI numbers. So I uh, would expect to see the authorities beginning to lean even more heavily against some of the, those actions in the coming months if that doesn't abate. Rob. What of the Asian consumer post-pandemic? Because if you take a look at the cautionary tale in China, that hasn't really come back. There were no stimulus checks, obviously. But does that mean that we're setting up for just permanent new spending patterns in the post-COVID era?
Yeah, well, the, the, the interesting thing about Asia is, of course, is that uh, m many of us are not uh, in a sort of reopening situation right now compared to the US or compared to much of Europe, which is talking this very sort of upbeat game and seeing people flooding back into the restaurants and the bars and, and you know, trying to talk about holidays now. That's still something that I think we're all, all sort of looking forward to and hoping that that happens. But with the vaccine rollout being as slow as it is, then we're entrenched in this current position where we, we, we sit at home and we go out for walks and there's not a lot else that we can do, many of us. Uh, and so I think until that changes, and that's really going to be a, a function of the vaccine rollout, um, that remains the future for us, at least for the next quarter or so.